We have some banners hanging on the wall with our, our theme for this year, which says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And down at the bottom of the banner is the dorm logo, which says, Residence Hall, welcome home. Even whether a student is new or returning, we put that on there because we want people to know if this is home. Uh, while they're here at Kettering College, they're home. And I'm reminded as I sing that one day he's coming, oh glorious day. There's coming a day when Jesus is going to look you and me in the face, uh, in the eye, face to face, and he's going to say, welcome home. Ah, oh, what a glorious day. Cheers.
day when we see you face to face and we will dance on the streets that are golden singing your praise worshiping you and yet it's a thrill and honor a privilege for us to worship you not just someday but right here today to lift you up to praise you to bring our hearts to you because of what you've done for us and because you came and you took our sins and died in our place and promised us a a wonderful future of eternity with you. Jesus, we thank you for that. We worship you. We praise you. And we come to you today in prayer to, to say we are yours, to give you ourselves, to give you our burdens, the things that are on our hearts. Jesus, this morning we, we pray for those on the East Coast facing, facing a storm. We pray for safety for them. Place your hand over, over, over th those people who are in the storm's path. Let them know that even when storms of life hit us, you are there bringing security and safety, comfort. Jesus, some of us here today are facing our own storms, and we're needing that touch from you as well. Whatever it is in our lives, you know what, what these things are. And you promise your presence in the storm. We're reminded that you are the one who stood up in the middle of a storm in the back of a boat and said, peace, be still. You can calm the storms of our life, Jesus. 
and you can call us your children. We pray for that today. We thank you for it. We give you our worship. We can't wait to see you. Amen. Good morning. There once was this family. I won't give their first names. I'll let you substitute the names in that you want to give them. But the father, he was a man of God. He served God. He had a wonderful wife, two boys, went to church faithfully. Prayed together, worshiped together. Just the ideal, ideal family. But you know, sometimes even to good people, bad things happen. And this man of God, he got sick. Already as a, you know, a man of God, uh, most preachers don't make a lot of money, you know, unless you're a, well, I was going to say Max Lucado, but I don't know how much money he makes. He hasn't, he hasn't shared that with me. But, you know, it's not a lot of money in it. And, you know, the hospital bills started coming in. School tuition for the boys. They didn't have a lot of money. They were on tough times. Inns were not meeting. But they believed in God. They owed money. They got further and further into debt. And one day he passes away. Leaves his beautiful wife, two wonderful boys all by themselves. She doesn't have work. She has no money. And we pick up the story in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1, at this point. She is in a major moment of crisis. Not only is she reeling from the loss of her husband, we find here in the story that she's going to lose her boys. Life is not fair. Bad things happen to good people. But there's God. So what does she do in this crisis? She does the only thing that she knows to do. She goes to God for her answer. She goes to the prophet of God, Elisha. She comes to Elisha in tears, and we pick it up in verse 1. It says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. That's how the system worked. You can't pay your bills. You become slaves for a set period of time until that is worked off. She did not have anything that she could do to stop this, but to turn to God. Verse 2, so Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. In other words, the house was destitute. There wasn't any food. There wasn't any rice. There wasn't any beans. There was nothing but a jar with a little bit of oil. Notice that Elisha didn't reveal the winning lottery numbers to her. How many of, you know, Lord, you just give me those numbers. We'll both be set. He didn't pass the hat around. He didn't go to the seminary, the 
the school of the prophets and pass the hat around and say, here, everyone give some money, we're going to help this. Well, no, he didn't do that. Didn't go to the government. He went to the source. Notice in this story, he wanted this lady to be a part of the miracle. He wanted her to be a part of her answered prayer. She must surrender all that she has into the hands of God. Then she will receive a blessing. Elisha asked a simple question. What do you have in your house? It may be small, but what asset or talent do you have that could be applied to your problem? When I was 9 or 10 years old, uh, well, actually when I was a kid, every year we'd go to camp meeting. I grew up in, in southern Oregon. We'd always go up to Gladstone Camp Meeting in northern Oregon. And loved it. Grew up every summer going to camp meeting. And I remember this one year, uh, it was just my, my mom and I were at camp meeting. Uh, my brothers were old enough to stay home and work, and they were just going to come up on the weekends. And the neat thing about camp meeting, if you're the right age, you could bring your red wagon with you, and you could sit outside of the ABC bookstore where all the food... Um, veggie food is sold, and you could, if someone asked you to, you could haul their food back to their truck, their car, their tent, their cabin, their motorhome, whatever, their horse and buggy, whatever they came in. And uh, I don't know exactly why, but somewhere in the middle of that week, we, we discovered, my mom and I, that we really didn't have the money we needed to have the food we needed to eat. I don't know if she felt really called to give the money in the offering plate. You know, I don't know what happened, but we didn't have money for food. I made this, I, I made this deal with God. You know, use your talents, use whatever you have. I had a wagon, lots of muscle, still have a lot of muscle today. That was, that was a joke, I really, I really don't. <laughs> I said, God, if you help me find customers, you help me find people that need me to tow their food back to their cabins, whatever, I will give you 50% of what I earn to you. I will put 50% in offering. We'll be a 50-50 partner. And do you know, God bless that little contract. I was, there may be a line, of, a line of wagons waiting, eager boys to help pull, pull people's food, but people would come right up to me, ask me to take their food, and they, they would pay me quite well. We, we had money to buy our food, and we had money left, I, I had money left over after my 50%. That wasn't after, that wasn't net profits, none of that, that was gross profits, you know, I had a lot of overhead, but I didn't count the overhead. Um, but God blessed that. How much does this poor widow have? Her house is empty. She has nothing except a small, inconsequential, almost empty jar of oil. The cupboards were bare. The checkbook was exhausted. The debt was high. She's bankrupt. Does she file bankruptcy? No. File chapter 13? No. She files a request with God. That is what happened. That is what you need to do. Her poverty was the key to her solution. She has faith. Think about it. David picked up a few stones and went after Goliath. Daniel was thrown in the lion's den and was unharmed. Now they say the angels shut the mouth of the lion so the lion wouldn't be able to eat Daniel. Let me tell you something. Daniel had faith. If that was Jeff Bovee thrown in that lion's den, those lions wouldn't have eaten me 
they would have mauled me to death because I would have been screaming bloody murder the whole time. They would want to stop me from screaming. Not Daniel. A woman touched Jesus' clothes and was healed. Faith. Naaman dipped seven times in the dirty Jordan River to be cured of leprosy. Didn't want to do it. What a crazy request from God. But he did it. What do you do when your back is against the wall? Where do you turn? Who do you trust? The widow was about to lose her two precious boys. What do you do when the world is against you? Where do you turn? September 8, 2008. I got a phone call about 7 or so in the evening. I'd already had my supper, and I was actually, believe it or not, I was working on a puzzle. I don't think I've worked on a puzzle since that date. But I was working on a puzzle, and I got a phone call from Steve Erickson. Jeff, the school is on fire. Steve, really? No, Jeff, the school. I said, well, you know, what? You know, I was thinking, okay, there might have been a small contained fire somewhere, and it's going to be out. Rushed over to the school, and I could not believe what I saw. Black smoke billowing out of all the doors. So, oh, Jeff, what did you get yourself into? Out of all of the Christian schools in North American Division, you had to pick the one that was going to have a fire. Why me? I knew immediately that this was a crisis that was way, way beyond me, way beyond all of us. School, we were only three weeks into school. I remember standing there just devastated, trying to keep it together. You know, you're the leader, you got to be strong. And I remember this still small voice saying, be still and know that I am God. As I was standing there, my mind was going through all the other principles that I know, thinking, that one would be the one to take care of this one, this this issue. Why not not this person? I was going down the list of all the principles I know, and I realized, Jeff, you're the one that's here. And God does not give you more than you can bear. He will not give you more than you can bear. There are so many miracles that came out of that situation. There are so many answers to prayer. We don't have time to go through all of them. Many times we did not know. I mean, we didn't know the answer to a pressing question that needed to be known for the next day. But when the time came, we had the answer. We had to walk in faith. I say we because it was a whole community that walked through that. There were a number of people that were at the center of the decision-making and planning, but it was a community, and not just the Seventh-day Adventist community, the entire community. We had offers from public schools, other private schools, churches, all kinds of churches. Businesses wanted to open their doors. So many people wanted to help us in our time of need. We must have faith in God in our time of need. Adventist education is too important. It was too important to fail. We had no choice but to rebuild. We had no choice to find another place to hold school. We had to move forward with whatever God made available to us, and he did make things available to us. It wasn't always what we wanted, but it was always precisely what we needed. Our young people must receive training and be in a nurturing environment where they can learn to know, follow, and share Jesus. We must teach our young people to know, follow, 
and share Jesus. I have seen so many miracles in the lives of young people. Last year, we had a, it was a series of events at Spring Valley Academy that really, really culminated um, to give us a great end of the school year. And it's interesting because each, each, each event, each thing we went through, they weren't necessarily, it wasn't necessary that we, uh, we planned this as exact order how it was going to go. And we had Rachel's Challenge uh, come out in, in January, and then we had uh, Great Lakes Academy come down. And when Great Lakes Academy came, and their young people worked with our young people and opened up to each other, a miracle was born. Young people gave their lives to Christ. You know, when I, as I work with young people, and I, I've worked at different schools, I never, I never want to give up on any of them. God does not give up on any of them. And sometimes we may feel that the world would be perfect if so-and-so was not in the school, or because their behavior is so bad. They are beyond help. Nonsense. No one is beyond God's help. We must be patient. We must be nurturing. We must use discipline. Sometimes we have to make decisions and say, you know, right now, Spring Valley Academy may not be the best place for you. Go somewhere else for a while. Come back. But I have seen over and over and over again, Christ touched the life of a young person and changed them forever. Amen. When you and I may have given up on them, Christ does not give up. Please remember that. Think of what he's done in your life. There's also miracles of generous donors, worthy student money that helps. There's 30% of our students who may not be able to be at Spring Valley without worthy student dollars. Half of our worthy student dollars comes from the Kettering Health Network. Wonderful. Excellent. You may say, that's not a miracle. That's the network giving the money. That is a miracle. Amen. They don't have to give the money to worthy students. They don't have to support Adventist education. There's a lot of great things to be supported. That's a miracle. Many of you are giving to the worthy student dollars. We have never had to turn a student away because there wasn't enough worthy student money. Now, there have been times when people maybe wanted a little bit more than we could give, but we have been able to help every single student that wanted to be at Spring Valley Academy. That is a miracle from God. The Kettering Seventh-day Adventist Church is a major partner, a strong partner, a crucial partner to Christian education. And I appreciate that. Let's go back to the widow, her sons, and a miracle in the making. It is when we place our faith in the hands of God that we see his power. When our situation becomes desperate, God's power shines the brightest. Our greatest need is what God looks for. If you are sitting here today with a great pressing need, then this story is for you. In verse 3, he sa uh, it says, Then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. Quickly, this desperate widow and her sons began going through the neighborhood, asking for empty jars. There's three people going through the neighborhood. Can I have a vessel? Can I have a jar, please? Empty? Why? Why do you need a jar? She must have been a good neighbor because a lot of people gave her their empty pots, jars, jugs of every type. Times must have been hard back then because there were a lot of empty jars. You ever thought about that? I don't think they dumped their stuff out to give her a jar. They gave her their empty jars. They filled the kitchen with empty jars, the living room with empty jars, the bedrooms with empty jars. It was wall-to-wall -wall jars. Elisha had said, don't just ask for a few. 
I think in our spiritual walk with Jesus, we need to expect abundance. God wants to give you as much as you make provision for. She was as rich as her faith. The oil was a fuel for light. It was used for cooking, cosmetics, healing, anointing. The list goes on and on. Everybody needed oil. She struck oil. In verse 4, And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, and uh, then pour it into all those, those vessels and set aside the full ones. This mother knew what to do. She followed the instructions to the letter. She prayed and God answered her deepest needs. The only limitation seems to be the number of clean, empty vessels that she had in her house. The oil flowed into the clay containers. Complex molecules in that tiny flask of oil were miraculously multiplied. Only as the oil was used was it replenished. The moment that you step out in faith and actually use God's power, more power will be given to you. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came to the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. Do you see how extravagant God is? He gave her more than she needed to pay her debts. Our God is a God of abundance. She had amazing faith and was obedient. How many of us would have followed Elisha's directions? How many of us would have made excuses as to why we didn't want to go borrow jars from people. How embarrassing. How embarrassing. God has an unlimited supply of what we need. He is only limited by our ability to receive. He is limited to our capacity to receive. How many gallons of oil can you put in a one-gallon jar? A one-gallon jar will only hold one gallon of oil. There are a number of stories in the Bible about the capacity to receive. One story, Jesus was, was preaching by the lake, and uh, he saw two, two empty boats. He stepped into one of the boats, and he said to Peter, push off a little bit, and then he preached. And then he said something rather strange. He said, throw your net in the water. Peter's like, Really? We were fishing all night long. We didn't catch anything. Nobody, nobody fishes during the day. But he did it anyway. What kind of leader was Christ? He asked people to do crazy things and they did it. I mean, I sometimes ask people to do sane things and they look at me like I'm crazy. Put the net in the water. The net was so full, it started to break. Filled up one boat. They called the, called the other boat over. Filled both boats. Now let me ask you a question. Why were only two boats filled with fish? Because there were only two boats. It's not because Christ's capacity to deliver fish was reached. It was the capacity to receive the fish, to receive the blessing. What is your capacity? How much faith do you have? Do you know him? Do you follow him? Are you a fisher of men and share others with him? What is your capacity to know? What is your capacity to follow? What is your capacity to share? Oil, as you know, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, poured out according to our capacity to receive. God wants to give his people an abundance of the Holy Spirit. His ability to give the Holy Spirit is only inhibited by our capacity to receive. This story is about the impoverishment of the church. That's what it's about. We Christians are in a mess. 
we are in a deep spiritual debt. We live in a spiritual poverty when full wealth awaits us. Here we are living on rice and beans when a whole banquet is available to us. We could be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants. We have to turn to Jesus. Revelation 3.17 says, Because you say I'm rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Consider the jars. What were the jars made of? Each jar was made of clay. What are we made of? According to Genesis 2-7, we are made of clay. Those clay jars represent people, you, me. What does God want to do with those jars? He wants to fill them. What does he want to do with us? He wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Jesus can't pour the Holy Spirit into a vessel that's already full of other things. He needs an empty vessel. We need to be cleared out of our self-sufficiency, our sins washed out, cleaned out. Then we may be filled with the gift of heaven. That's when the widow's oil, that's where the widow's oil came from. Our oil will come from the same place. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is the container, the jug, the jar, the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, Jesus wants to fill you with his power. When you have the oil of the Holy Spirit in your life, it will lead you to total debt cancellation. Debt cancellation is what Jesus is all about. You see Jesus, you see Jesus wants to cancel your debt. You are in debt from your sins. Only the Holy Spirit can cancel that debt. That day, that believing widow went from rags to riches. The instant you come to Jesus, you go from trusting in your filthy rags to trusting in his righteousness. You are rich. You possess eternal life. Your sins are all forgiven. Someday, the creditor is going to knock on your door. Each of us has been... And I just turned it off. Just a second. Here we go. Each of us has been born with an enormous debt hanging over our heads. We can never pay it. But praise be to God, Jesus paid it all. Accept Jesus as your Savior and you can trust him to take care of everything. Desire of Ages tells us, page 672, Many will not submit to this. They want to manage themselves. This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. Only to those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the spirit given. The power of God waits their demand and reception. This promise, this promised blessing, claimed by faith, brings all other blessings in its train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and he is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. Just imagine the work that the Holy Spirit could do through each of us if we emptied of self. Imagine how our ministries would be impacted. Imagine what we could accomplish as a church, as a community. Imagine what could be accomplished at Spring Valley Academy. Spring Valley Academy is all about teaching students to know, follow, and share Jesus. By the grace of God, we are in the capacity-building business. We strive to lead young people to the source, the capacity-filling source. Are you willing to open your heart, mind, and will to the Holy Spirit? Are you willing to be emptied of self, to become a vessel for him? How many earthen jars do we have here today that are ready to be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit? Please stand with me if you are an earthen jar willing to be filled to capacity. Praise God. What is your capacity?
what incredibly great news that our debt has been canceled because of what Jesus did as he poured out his blood on the cross. Let's uh, close our worship singing to him this morning.
bow our heads for the benediction. Our loving Heavenly Father, as we survey the wondrous cross, we thank you for your gift, and we accept your gift, Lord. Lord, prepare us to receive in full capacity what you have to give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning at First Serve. We invite you to leave tithes and offerings in the plate at the back of the room. Pick up a blue card to write someone a note of encouragement. Have a happy Sabbath.